Hello everyone, my name is Ryan Wolfson-Ford and I am a Southeast Asia Reference Librarian at the Asian Read Room of the Library of Congress. Today I would like to welcome you to a forum featuring a unique set of authors entitled Memory, Experience, and Imagination in the Works of Lao and Hmong American Authors. This event is co-sponsored by the Library of Congress Asian Division and the Library of Congress Asian American Association. During the presentation, each author Kao Kalia Yang, Brian Talwara, and Tavisok Prasavat will be given the stage, so to speak, to speak on their work, after which they will all join you in an open Q&A discussion session to answer your questions. This is perhaps the first time such an event has taken place at the library, bringing together Lao and Hmong American authors to reflect on their works. It is a chance to shine a spotlight on the three authors while featuring voices not often highlighted at the Library of Congress. Please note that we are recording this lecture. If you choose to participate, any of your comments or questions will be included as part of the recording. To participate in the Q&A, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen on Zoom to either to enter your questions and I will read them for the authors at the end of the presentation. Before we begin, I would like to say a few words about the Asian Reading Room at the Library of Congress and also highlight some materials in the Lao and Hmong collections. The Library of Congress is the largest library in the world. It has over 170 million items across more than 20 different reading rooms. While its mission is to serve Congress and the American people, more than 50% of the items in the catalog are in languages other than English. The library's mission is to serve as a universal source of knowledge, and so it contains representative works from all societies and cultures. The Asian Reading Room is the main point of access for Asian language texts at the Library of Congress. It has it holds 4.4 million physical items, making it one of the largest collections outside of Asia. It ha has nearly 200 languages and dialects, many from Southeast Asia. It holds rare and valuable items as well, such as the oldest Buddhist text in the world, or one of the oldest Buddhist texts in the world, the Gandhara scroll, and one of the oldest surviving printed texts in the world, the Yakumanto Dharani, which was printed on wood blocks in Japan around 770 AD. The Southeast Asia collection consists of works in over 100 languages, with more than 86 originating in the region. This includes nine national languages and 77 other languages. Titles in many of these languages are not usually found in libraries and archives. Among them are Hmong, Batak, Karen, Mangyang, and Balinese. Pictured here are a few examples from the, from the Lao collection. We recently received a donation of a memoir written by a former Prime Minister of Laos, Pui Sananigon. This text covers the pivotal years, 1949 to 1975, during which Pui himself served in many high offices. We also have several Lao manuscripts from before the 20th century. The oldest one for which a date is known dates back to 1832 and is written in Lao Buhan script. But many Lao texts were written in Tom script too. Pictured here is a Tom script Buddhist prophecy text from the neighboring Northern Thai state of Lanna. This next slide shows some collections from the Hmong collection. One unique item seen on the left is a language primer created by a Hmong religious leader, Zhu Menu, in 1962 and 1963. It is written in, in a unique messianic script, the Der Puazhu script, on the right is another text in a different but also religious script, the Pahua Hmong script. There are more items in the RPA and some in Lao script as well. Another important collection at the Asian Reading Room is the AAPI collection, which contains 27 collections, including those of Jade Snow Wong and Carlos Bulasan. It is also accessible by appointment. And in the AAPI collection, some Lao works are included, such as this Lao English magazine, Satri Lao. And we also have Hmong American works like this orientation manual. And we have Hmong language primers and religious texts. All to say the Library of Congress has rich holdings ready for serious research or to further general interest about these topics. To start your search at the library, please contact me through the Ask a Librarian Search service. 
Now for the main event, we are excited to introduce today's speakers, Kalkalia Young, Brian Tawora, and Tavisok Prasavat. Kalkalia Young is a Hmong American author of memoirs and other works on her experiences as a refugee in life in America. Her first memoir, The Late Homecomer, was recognized by the National Endowment for the Arts, among others. Most recently, she has published a collection of short stories about the refugee life of various groups in her home state of Minnesota called Somewhere in the Unknown World, a Collective Refugee Memoir. Brian Tawara is a Lao and Hmong American poet and author of numerous works. He has received numerous awards for his work, including from the Minnesota State Arts Board. He is also a recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship. His latest work, entitled Before We Remember We Dream, is a genre-breaking work blending myth, memoir, horror, and science fiction to elucidate 45 years of Lao diaspora history. Tavi Sok Prasavat is a Lao-American filmmaker and author of a memoir entitled Stepped Out of the Womb on his experience as a refugee in life in America. He's also an Academy Award nominated director of a documentary about his family entitled Neighbor Kun, The Betrayal. His current work is about Lao motherhood and focuses on his own mother and is titled Grace and Pressure. Without further delay, I'd like to welcome the authors. Kalia will speak first, followed by Brian before turning to Tabi Sook, after which we'll have the Q&A. So take it away, Kalia. Hello, everyone. I'm coming to you from St. Paul, Minnesota tonight and delighted to be a part of this conversation. It's taken us a long time to get to the Library of Congress. And so, um, like other experiences in my life, it is a first. I am excited tonight to read from Somewhere in the Unknown World, a collective refugee memoir. For those of you who know a little bit about me, I began my journey into the literary arts when my grandmother died. I was 22 years old. I was a, I was a senior in college. My grandma, who had promised me that she would never die because I was a child of the refugee camps because death surrounded my early years. Uh, in my senior year of college passed away. Her biggest fear was that she would be forgotten. My grandma, had never learned how to read or write. She'd never been in a classroom. And so I began my writing that very first book in an effort to remember her, to have the world remember her along with me. This book is uh, my ninth book. I write for both children and adults, and it is a collective refugee memoir. So often writers like me are cast into tiny, tiny little boxes. And this is again, when we're pushed and exploding those walls that hold so many of my brethren in. I'll be reading uh, from two different chapters in this book, but it opens with a poem by the great American poet, Lucille Clifton. Quilting. Somewhere in the unknown world, a yellowed eyed woman sits with her daughter quilting. Some otherwhere alchemists mumble over pots, their chemistry stirs into science, their science freezes into stone. In the unknown world, the woman threading together her need and her needle nods to the smiling girl. Remember, this will keep us warm. How does this poem end? Do the daughter's daughters quilt? Do the alchemists practice their tables? Do the worlds continue spinning away from each other forever? This book is uh, written for for the refugees from everywhere, men, women, and children whose fates have been held by the interests of nations, whose rights have been contested and denied, whose thirst and hunger go unheeded and unseen. And I'll begin the reading with a story uh, from Kalta, Quran American, a, a, a story titled Leaving with No Goodbyes. My story begins in a small Karen village in Burma where the chickens peck the ground and the canopies of tall trees provide shelter from the rain. At the beginning of the story, there is a man, a spoiled man, the youngest son of a family of girls. And then there is a woman, a competent, headstrong woman, the oldest of six children. There is no love story, but they marry, they become parents, my parents. In my time with my mother and father, they never talked of love as a feeling between people, a shared 
affection, attraction, a belief, a bond, a relationship that even death could not sever. They only talked of love in terms of country, a country we do not have as Karen people, one of the seven main ethnic minority groups in Burma. In a life where love was not a language for each other, my mother and father raised five children. I was their middle child, their most stubborn and independent child, the one who questioned everything. Sometimes with, but more often without words. What my father told me, it was time for me to become a monk for a season, as good Buddhist men do for the merit of their parents. I gave him a look. It was a formidable look with my slanted brows, my eyes dark as black fire. My rebellious heart, like their feelings for us, needed no words to be understood. I knew that I complied with his request only for him and mother, not for myself. When my oldest sister drowned in a nameless river, in a nameless place on a day that I would forget if I could, I experienced death for the first time, to leave with no goodbyes. On the day she died, I saw my mother and father cry until they had no more tears. They cried until they were dry. They cried until the words of love they had not expressed choked them. I was barely a man when I left my mother mother and father for the refugee camps in Thailand. I did not ask for their permission. It was 1994 and I had just graduated from high school, which was unaccredited but organized in the fashion of the old British powers. I did not know where my future lead, neither did they. I did not know. I had a suspicion I might spend my entire life in the jungle, living and dying for a place that could never exist in a country the size of Burma. I left on the grounds of politics and practicality. In a refugee camp in May Sot, a district in Western Thailand near the border, close to a village of Burmese migrants and refugees, I enrolled in a medical training program. There I met the first woman who was not like my mother. And I fell in love with her for all the reasons I loved my mother. This woman stood out to me not because she was the most beautiful woman, but because she was the most fun. She was not part of a big history she could not forget. She was just trying to become educated so she could help herself. That singular focus drew me. Her wanting to be independent and live spoke to me. I was far from the adults in my life, so there was no formal marriage. We agreed to a loving union. I was too young and unconcerned with what that might mean beyond having a casual bedmate and a conversational partner. In Mesa district, surrounded by the lush jungles, close to a waterfall, I took my first step as a man. In my union with a woman who decided to dedicate her life to me, we had three children together, three stateless children, citizens of no country, recognized by no nations. My beautiful baby boys were born with dark black hair, skin the color of the earth. Their maternal grandfather, an old man who, like his daughter, belonged to a war to the world as we knew it, not some imaginary place of freedom, gave my sons the gift of poetry. Karen names calling on their worth. Lala Ga was the first. His name meant that he was worthy of a country. Lala Hokka was the second. His name meant that he was worthy of the earth. Lala Mu was the third. His name meant he was worthy of the universe. I lived like a son and they revolved around me like planets, the women and the children of the stratosphere. Uh, Carl leaves the, district, the refugee camp for Bangkok to study with funding from the Soros Foundation, Open World Society, and there he meets an American woman, and I will read from that part now. I met an American woman named Jill. She worked on a team sent to interview refugees for resettlement. Jill was tall and her skin was smooth and pale. Her eyes were large and brown and smart, untouched, unclouded by cynicism and unfazed by hardship. They were empathetic and kind. They were so unlike my own. Beyond these things, Jill was well-fed, well-educated, and well-loved. She was comfortable in the world like a rock at the bottom of the river, feeling the movement from above, but steady and strong. Most intriguing, she was interested in me, and I found her refreshingly interesting. 
Jill was drawn to me as I was drawn to her, perhaps because I was everything she was not. We became friends knowing we could be something more. Jo left Thailand after her professional responsibilities were through. We'd only known each other for two months time. Over email and on the phone through the spread of four years, Jill and I talked of our days. For the first time in my life, I could laugh with someone about the hard things because the threat of them felt far away. Somehow, with Jill, the world was not a place of struggle. Each day, our bond grew stronger and stronger. I was not surprised when the time came and Joe asked, her voice soft, her words low, waited by all the reasons why ours was not a risky match, if she could petition for me to come to America on a fiancé visa. I hesitated. But well, the thing about life is this, when we are unsure, the universe isn't. In October of 2010, Jill successfully completed the paperwork I, I had been interviewed twice. I was approved to leave for America to reunite with Jill in Washington, D.C. I had been gone for so long, I knew goodbye was not necessary. Like my sister, I would leave with no goodbyes. I would be dead to them. The consequences of my leaving would be ours to bear, but we would all survive in the end, perhaps be made better by it. And that's just a little bit from uh, Call Paul's story. Paul, who is now in Minnesota, home to more refugees per capita than any other state in the nation. I will end with a small reading from uh, about a Hmong woman, Jumo, my mother, Natalie's same old tired world. The woman lay on the sofa, her head on its leathery arm, her cell phone in her hand. She put on weight with each breath, her stomach rose, a soft mound of flesh beneath her polyester shirt. She needed a haircut, her black hair kept short, had grown long, its strands covering her eyes like a teenage boy's. Her hair hadn't been this greasy since the years when she worked the night shift and then spent the days caring for her young children. She had used the time she had to wash her hair for sleeping instead. She looked sluggish, sagging flesh and clothing, sitting on the sofa, her iPhone in her hands. The woman spent all of her time looking at flowers on the internet. She knew how to find and save the photos, flowers from everywhere, from around the world, the tulip fields of Holland, the orchids of Thailand, the beautiful B Buddhist lotus ponds, the purple heathers of bloom on the English moors. Once she saved the photos, she passed the day editing them, changing the filters and cropping the images. She had never, she had over 11,000 pictures on her phone. Sometimes she was afraid. She saw black things the size of cats move across her living room floor. Her eyes frantic. She made no sound. Instead, she froze in place her only movement, her eyes helplessly searching for an exit from her body. She had vivid dreams of handsome men who came into her life on horses. They all wanted to marry her and take her away. In the dreams, she wanted to go with them, except she couldn't lift herself off the ground and onto the high horses. Her body was heavy in the dreams, anchored firmly to the earth. Sometimes she woke up reaching for the handsome men, only to feel the empty, lonely air of their absence. She couldn't sleep at night without the drugs. Even with them, during the day, she was tired, drowsy, sluggish. She had no heart for anything or anyone. Sometimes she cried for her dead father. It had been nearly half a century since his death, but to her it was fresh as the morning. Fresh as the morning. She believed she knew where he was. Always at the edge of the horizon. There he waited for her with wings like the birds. He sent messages to her. He offered a promise to lift her high so that she could soar through the skies. From there he told her, she wouldn't have to miss her children <clears throat> because she could still see them on earth. Most of the time though, she spent her days on the sofa looking at her phone. She did not have the energy to cook or to clean. Two things she had always attended as a matter of fact, as a matter of life and death for her children. At the doctor's office, the nurses gave her evaluations where she's designed to see if she was healthy or not. The questions asked if she was feeling any pain in her body. If yes, where? 
On a scale of one to 10, how much did she hurt? How often did she hurt? Was the pain less or more than at the last visit? The questions asked if she had energy for the daily work of the living. Was she able to focus on a book or a television show? Was this more or less than at the last visit? Each time she answered the same, the doctors increased the dosage of her medications. When one prescription did not work, the doctor shifted to another. The woman was put on Balbutrin, Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Effexor, Cymbalta, and more. One pill made her believe she was on the cusp of death. Her heart started racing. She grew short of breath. She spoke her death wishes. Keep the funeral simple. I don't want my death to be complicated. At the doctor's office, on the suicide question, she shook her head adamantly and said, my biggest fear is that I'll die and leave my children behind. I would never kill myself. She wept. The doctor asked why she was so sad. She answered, I don't know. I don't know what to do with myself. I'm out of work. I'm too young to be useless. My children need a mother who can take care of them. The doctor wanted her to go out into the world. Yes, she could no longer find a job with her shoulder being so bad, her disability documented, but perhaps she could volunteer in a community organization. She can drive, she can speak good enough English. Her hands hurt, her feet hurt, her neck hurt. She was falling apart. The doctor said she could not change the conditions of the woman's life. The only thing she could do was change the conditions of the woman's head. No one knew what to do with her heart. And that's just a little bit from Natalie's same old tired world. Um, again, I became a writer so that my grandma might be remembered. That continues to be the reason why I write today, why I do the work that I do from where I'm positioned. I'm very short and I spend a lot of my time looking at the ground, but the sky calls to me. And that is why I work in creative nonfiction for both children and adults. I am my mother's daughter, the woman who sits on every single chair and swings her legs. And I'm super proud of this fact. This is not an image that people think about when they think of a Hmong woman. This is not the kind of stuff that people will ask about when they meet a Hmong woman. But this is the kind of stuff that makes our lives what it is. And that is who Ngokaliaya is, a writer who writes to confront life the way it is for so many of the world's population, so many homeless people looking for belonging in a world that creates more and more refugees all the time. I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you to Ryan Wolfson Wolf Ford for having all of us. Again, this is the first time for a Hmong American writer to be presented on a panel like this, to be presented by the Library of Congress and I am delighted to be a part of it. I look forward to your questions in a little bit. Um, Brian, I believe you're next. Is this true? You're, you're muted, my friend. <sighs> That's what happens being a writer here is that you have those moments where you know, technology always gets in the way. Yeah, but anyway, so I do watch on dark. Um, thank you so much you know, for this incredible introduction to you know the journey that our communities take. And so as a poet, I am going to uh, do a couple of pieces you know, from my work across the years here because I think that's the best way you know, to start to see how I approach the um, question of how do we engage with our identities, who we are, who we have been and who we are becoming, and how do we envision and express a future in which we see ourselves, particularly through the lens of poetry, which is not always the most intuitive you know, form of um, the literature and the literary arts with which we might um, try to both recapture our experiences and to reimagine and build upon. But enough of a preface, here are some poems. Ironies, after 30 years of poetry, I learned at least 100 words in no less than two tongues, unique to our journey as refugees, to fill vacuums and bloody gaps of our disrupted histories. Recovering families, 
is meant to an enemies, identifying the official tools of allies bombing us for our own good, their policies of destruction and resettlement, how to win hearts and minds in diaspora, from DC to Modesto, Anchorage to the Twin Cities, walking into a thousand classrooms, strangers to the beauty of Yenchan, Savannah Gate, a heartfelt Sabadi, gathering ink storm clouds to change worlds. One poem still can tell my whole story. This was a poem called Kao Jai. And to have a heart and to understand, to be Jayan, my heart, cool, without worries, I smile like a knock, a rainbow bridge, a June rain, trying to find a middle path I'm happy. I've seen how much difference one person can make. I don't want anyone to fall behind in our beautiful city. As a writer, I never want a title, a grade, or a sheet of paper to hold a soul back from all the good they can do in the world. A head of knowledge is worth more than a tray full of gold and jewels, our elders say. But every head is unique and capable of generosity. Some will learn everything they need in life from a book, but others will find a page inadequate even in the schools of Sihon. Some discover galaxies in the motion of a single human body. Others can gaze at the finest dancers of Vincha and remain unchanged. There are those whose greatest teachers are a touch. Some can be blind and with a single piano move nations. Some must discover on their own free of deaths and distractions. We fail the world, ourselves, if we don't seek the best for one another. If we're unkind to someone whose only crime is they aren't like us, or they make their way through the world by a different road than ours. But I'm just a knucklehead, a poet. There are people in the world who've trained a lifetime to change things so much better than I, a Philippine, we're laughing not of tea, and any day now, they'll do their job properly. But I think back on our journey because as we head into um, the next year, we will be seeing the 50th anniversary since the end of the United States secret bombing of Laos and by extension, the end of a secret war in Laos. And for many of us, that is also the start of our diaspora. Here, and we have to start to begin to ask ourselves what it means to be an American um, and to be someone with roots in Laos you know, 50 years later and how we do that journey. This is one of the earlier poems I remember you know, that I had always written with the hope that perhaps the next generation itself might be able to find some wisdom from it, even as I try to fill in the gaps of my own experience. Japanism, Laoism. In my kitchen, I'm watching the world through Lao eyes, making my meal on a foreman grill with American hands, or is it the other way around? Growing in the shadow of maples and pine cones, when the actor was in office, there were nearly no books available about the kingdom of the New York Times. Like many people, a tattered issue of National Geographic was my closest glimpse of a land I left nearly 30 years ago as a wait of six months. And like all those impressionable French in Paris after Paris' thunderous stunts in the Yokohama docks, we were busy watching the toys and dials pouring in from the Ginza. Shogun warriors and roar and atomic kaiju smashing Tokyo's matchstick streets occupied the children, while Detroit and Zenith squirmed at their fallen market share, wailing about MacArthur and our post war treaties. The word, Sabaidi, was unheard of as we struggled just to say sayonara is a sign of our culture. As sincere as those shrubs, we fopped off as bonsai, out of the unsuspected. Back then, papayas were as rare as pat pat. It was sushi that was all the rage, with wasabi horseradish that would set your nostrils on fire, gasping for water. I was trained to revere razor-sharp katanas in Zen, stoic as a bowl of udon. The heroes of my father, in the ruins of Lanshan and Ron Perban, were barely footnotes, ground into mud in the aftermath of wars no one wanted to remember. And now, 
My skeletal editors are calling on me with their chattering skull. Where are your words for Fanun and Chao Anu, over fallen honor at Papatusa? In all this time, truly, one word about Finch will not kill you or your friends. It's hard to answer, sitting down to eat in July. Write what you know, my teachers admonish. Sip in my soda, I turn the pages of a weather book of Van Gogh print, inspired by Hokusa, and sigh. My flag is as obsolete as the word Indochi, and I realize today that I am older than my father lived to be. It's been too long since I last saw an elephant or the monstrous river catfish. They tell me somberly, a freshwater irrelevant dolphin will likely be extinct before I come by. I couldn't sketch any of them, I tried. A part of me wants to smack the next person who says, I won't be Lao if I don't write about Laos. Do cops stop being cops when they're arguing about the White House and crooked pardons? Do robbers become priests if they talk about faith? Riviera saw the peaks of Hiroshima's Fujiyama among Eiffel's iron girders and still died, French and human. Just right, young man. I hear my father whisper, just write. We will sort it all out later. And with last bite, I return to making my own book with a defiant smile. <sighs> my journey was you know, a complicated one, you know, like many of, you know, of the nearly 500,000 Lao, Mong, Kumu, Tai Dong, Yang Men, you know, Yao, Lu, and so many others who have roots in. Many of us arrived in the aftermath of the conflict that ended formally in 1975. As the adopted child of an American civilian, I was raised in places as different from the tropics as you could imagine. Montana, Alaska, Michigan, Milwaukee. And for my generation growing up in the 1970s and 80s, there were nearly no books about the school. Nearly five decades later, there's still fewer than 50 books in our own words and on our own terms. That representation matters. One of the challenges and the barriers for you know, my journey was a stunning lack of public familiarity with the way the Lao story was intertwined with the American story. And perhaps over time, we will start to see how you know, the aftermath of the secret war has consequences that led all the way into you know, our modern world you know, from 9 11 to you know, our current you know, histories today. But there was a time when many people didn't know what to do with our stories, but it didn't fit into model like one that didn't you know, reflect you know, what everyone was so familiar with. And so in many ways, it you know, became more important for me to start taking on work that was engaged with speculative literature, that form of uh, poetry that you know, was informed by science fiction, fantasy, horror, and other imaginative genres. Well, there we might be able to at least reimagine ourselves, perhaps as heroes, perhaps as villains, perhaps something more, perhaps something not better, but different. Who knows? This is the um, ongoing question that we have as we try to share our journey with the world, you know, and that we look at the consequences and the aftermath of the Vietnam War that left you know, Laos contaminated with over you know, 30% of you know, my former homeland you know, with United States cluster bombs you know, decades after the end of the conflict. And you know, what does that mean for us as we rebuild you know, in a country with that legacy? But anyway, there's a much bigger conversation that we can have on all that. And I'd like to make sure that we have enough time for Tommy to take it away here because it's been, oh, how many years now, over a decade. You know, that reminds me so much of why we can't take our time with one another. Tavi, Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tavi. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Ryan and all the team from Library of Congress to make this evening very special and historical. <clears throat> Please excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm just so choking up all of those incredible stories from Brian <clears throat> and, and Kel. 
So anyway, um, <clears throat> I just want to um, share with you why mainly I write these books. <laughs> um, Step Out of the Womb uh, was written as an extension of the film, uh, The Betrayal Nero Kun. Uh, for those who haven't seen the film yet, the film is about my family journey from a war-torn country, Laos, coming to America right after the end of the Vietnam War. The films ex explore the core of what happened to the family of those who uh, served the secret air war in Laos during the Vietnam War. So due to the uh, film mediums uh, that have specific screen times and uh, restriction, so the film ended up raising more questions than giving the answer to the audience. So I felt like it's my responsibility that I have to um, uh, give more information so uh, some of the questions can be answered and also updating uh, all the audience. Because this, uh, the film, The Betrayal, is taking 23 years in the making. So, um, so it's, it's, I feel it was necessary that I have to update uh, the audience up to where we are. So beside writing uh, as an extension, uh, you know, uh, for the film, but personally, uh, writing to me is always my uh, hobby. It's my uh, personal way of self-expression, self-healing and therapy. Um, more specifically about uh, Step Out of the Womb. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's a memoir. Uh, it's contained nine different chapters. Uh, uh, my way of signifying the um, period of nine months of a child living inside of the mother's womb. And also symbolize my nine different life that I already struggle and live and survive through it. <laughs> so I begin the book with the, uh, my name, uh, simply because in Lao culture, uh, name is the first gift, is, is a gift, the first gift that our parents and grandparents have gave to us, uh, us to, <clears throat> as an identification, more or less. So we can identify uh, as an individual and also who we are as a person. So since the beginning of uh, my living uh, life here in America, back in the 80s in uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, the question of identities became such a matter for general uh, American publics. <clears throat> They were so curious about who we are, what we are, why we are here. And of course, the, uh, the uh, public knowledge is very lacking about what happened to us and why we are here. You know, um, because after living a while in, in America, you know, I, I begin to get tired of, uh, I have to create an Lao as an imagination country because nobody knows where Lao is. So I end up telling people, Lao was a smaller country next to Canada. And of course, um, two weeks later, um, <laughs> I end up being known as the, uh, the, uh, the new Eskimos in the neighborhood. So, and, uh, <clears throat> so as you can see, this book I wrote in, in very chronological order. It's very easy to, uh, to follow. Um, just for me, the reason I, I, I I want to write this book is really I want to it's, it, it was my application that uh, application that I have to I felt like it's our duty to educate it uh, to educating the, the American public because uh, we cannot depend on the US foreign policies or the, the history you know because our history was supposed to be known anyway. That's why we have, we have secret air war in Laos. So anyway, um, 
that's what inspired me to write basically just want to i feel like it's my obligation and that i have to find a way to educate it, uh, uh american publics you know because every time when i tell people that i'm from laos you know i people always, always ask me like you want me to speak louder it seemed like i'm having an ear problem so i just like okay uh is our duty as a community that we have to share uh, our story and uh, this is just a great honor to be here tonight to able to share this you know and i don't have much uh, to share but i'm just gonna read uh, a little part of the uh, of the books just give me one second so i can read <laughs> <clears throat> this is the, uh, the part right before I escaped to Thailand. Through thick wood, I crawls and ran. Through thick wood, I ran and crawl. Stuff after stuff, my barefoot slipped through the wet dew and sharp soul leaf. Bits by bits, I slid through the shadow of darkness. Now I was a lost child with a heavy heart, living with a hundred thousand trouble, stumble to a thousand fear. Here <clears throat> I go, crawling to sharp reef, following the sounds of the river. All of a sudden, I felt a welcoming longing for that it's calm my nerve and covering my flesh the death the longing death was so close and near that i could feel its present i went through the moments of transcendence and was totally dazed by it when i got down to the edge of the mekong river it seemed to be getting even darker I, couldn't, <clears throat> I could clearly hear the voice of the Pate Lao soldier who were drinking, chatting, and singing a few hundred feet away. I crawled through the mud and read down to the water. I took a moment to rest and hide under the, paddle, uh, under the puddles of mud. I grabbed a handful of it put into my head and pray to Metharani, the godmother of the earth, to protect me on my journey. I closed my eyes and held my breath and talked to her and talked to her as if she were accompanying me there. I slowly stepped into the water. Then I said, This could be my last minute, or this could be my continuum. If I'm going to die this second, I'm going to die anyway. So I took all my clothes and blew up my plastic bags to float me across the river. I said, let's leap up to the nature of the world. Now I'm going, no matter what. I will gladly to die in this water and be food for the fish. It was cool and peaceful. I was drifting along with the currents of the Mekong River. Slowly, slowly, I was going and going, further away from the home. I stepped out of the wombs, which bears my birds, bury my umbilical cord, comforting me with love and gave me identity. Slowly, slowly, I drip away into the darkness and nothing else. And that's all I want to share. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Tavi. And thanks, Brian and Kalia. Uh, now we can turn to the question and answer portion. Uh, I'm going to not use my camera right now just because my internet connection is not very stable. Uh, but 
uh, I was wondering, we have uh, question, some questions in the Q&A box, but uh, I hope everyone can uh, feel free to add their questions to the Q&A box as we go through. Uh, you should see the boxes at the bottom of your screen and you just have to click on that and type in your questions and we can address those. Uh, but maybe one question to start out with would be uh, to ask everyone, you know, how do you think uh, memory, experience, and imagination play a role in your work? And, uh, you know, I, reading your work, I, I have, um, you know, these vivid, uh, vivid images of your experiences uh, and your recollections that I get from reading your work. Uh, so maybe, uh, maybe I'll ask Kalia uh, first and then Brian and, and Tavisuk, if that's okay. Yes. Thank you, Ryan, for this really thoughtful question. So as I said at the beginning of my presentation, I became a writer to preserve in many ways the legacy of a woman who never learned how to read or write. Growing up in Bamidai refugee camp for the first six years of my life, unable to go to school, I understood that I had to remember the words that were spoken to me. And in, in, there was a piece of my heart, I think, that, I, that has always understood that, that these words would become the foundation of my history. You know, I don't, I don't have an incredible memory for names, but when people say something and it strikes my heart, I hold it fast for a long, long time. I also understood when I started training as a memoirist, I went to Columbia University School of the Arts for my MFA in creative nonfiction. I understood then that memories were not just my own. It's not just the things that have happened to me. In fact, it isn't only the stories that I've inherited. Both of these things must make do in a world that contains its own memories, often documented, often without voices like ours. And so I think that for me is like the beginning of imagination. How do I transform these memories, weave them into a fabric that has proven time and again that it didn't need the threads of who we are? And how do, I, how do I do that in such a way that if I cannot win you with the argument, that I can win you with the beauty of the prose itself? Or, or perhaps deepen your understanding, not only for my own story, but for yours, what it means to be a human being, what it means to put your hand right up to the pulse of a greater humanity. When I first became a writer, I was asked, you know, how does it feel to be a Hmong American writer? Um, and my father was in the same room with me. After that, that conversation on the way home, he said to me, did that, did that teacher ask you what it was like to be my daughter? And I said, kind of. And my father said to me, may I, little one, dear one, the work you would do will go beyond your gender. It will go beyond your people. It is for a bigger humanity. I think that memory, imagination, transformation, all of these things allow a writer like me to live in the literary landscape. I come from Minnesota, a state that is in very high in diversity. When people think about uh, a Minnesotan author, they rarely think about me. You know, wherever I go, people say, oh, there's, there's Ngo Kalia Ya, a writer from the Hmong American community. Um, but I don't become an American writer until I leave America's borders. These are just the realities of my journey into the world, my journey into the field. Um, and, and I've come to accept these possibilities as spaces to perhaps circumvent people's limited expectations of me. The, the biggest comment I get when people come to my talks, when they read my books is, uh, this is not what I expected. And it is meant as a compliment. I am perhaps more than they expected. The people I come from has more to offer a bigger world than what they thought was possible. And so I try to transform it into a space of possibility all the time. And that is, I think that is why I do creative nonfiction. That is also why I do a bit of poetry and why I play in fiction. I wanna see how each of these structures can work on behalf of the, of the bigger whole. I know exactly what team I'm playing on. It's just a way of crossing all these boundaries and barriers that keep us away from others, that keep us apart as human beings. Um, do we just popcorn? If we do, uh, Brian, will you go next? We'll keep the order consistent. I'll take, I'll take the order next, Ben. Thank you. Let's see, I think Ben Vett also ties into this great question, how poetry and literature capture our experience in the way that history, sociology, and academic fields start capturing. And 
this is the question uh, as we look at our you know, at our shared collective history. This is an issue that's affected me personally, and I've also watched it um, in trying to recover my own family's personal narrative and their own personal um, experiences as well. But you know, with time and time again, you know, we run into so many people who um, can say that they have roots in Laos, in Vermont experience, in Taidam Khmu experiences, you know, so many other you know, communities there that were affected by that conflict, but by the literal nature of the secret war, you know, so much of the existing narratives that we had couldn't necessarily be you know, trusted at face value, you know, much as you know, the old you know, saying goes, history is you know, written by the victors or the survivors. And then the question is that, you know, I always felt that, you know, as much as I had to go into these communities and hear so many amazing stories, you know, then they were also coming to me out of order and, you know, out of sync in some cases to protect the innocent. In other cases, you know, they had different agendas and, you know, you know we would have to, you know, find out that there were often many times just flat out gaps and sometimes people would give you something to fill in that you know, space there because something had to be there. And other times it's just, you know, they don't even know how to begin talking about it. such big issues. And so that's why you know, I've been doing that. But you know, when I, I'm talking with my students, the question is, is that when you start working in poetry, then, then you can at least you know, respond at first to the experiences as you come across them. Maybe today it's 1978. Maybe tomorrow we're in 1984. Next year we might be, you know, getting stories that come to us all the way from 1987, 1992, you know, and that way, you know, at some point, at least in poetry, you can start to see a little bit easier things. Like the way that we're usually trained in writing prose and nonfiction, we're always supposed to go in this very American style, you know, this precision of January 1973, February 1973. And, you know, and so many of our families don't have that. And I didn't want the next generation, or let alone myself, um, to be held back um, because we're just waiting for an answer that might never come. And that's just the uh, painful truth of it. And along the way, I suppose, the other thing that I would say is that you have to remember that um, all of us are you know, coming out of authoritarian systems, that some from the Lao People Democratic Republic, others from the old Royal Lao government, which is this hierarchical um, dissemination of information, everything comes from the top down, and you just take it. But you, you know, we're all trying to be participants in these republics, in these democracies. And part of that in our writing and our creativity then has to be to give people the freedom to risk, to be a part of that conversation, you know, to just get their stories out there and that everyone can be heard. Maybe and you know, we all come to the same common agreement, but it's also, you know, as we make that pivot, as we start to explore what that means, that everyone gets to have a voice, that beauty within it. Just, you know, you know, how do we always keep coming back to the table? And we agree we have a culture that's worth coming back to, not just for what we had, but what we can have. Tommy, what do you think? Put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> Memories, imagination. <clears throat> to me personally, um, that's what the few that that few the engines of my existence as an artist. My memory is is my ins inspiration, is the thing that I built upon. Uh, the thing that I can use to transcend them into a body of works that that can have to build that imagination to somehow reality or something that tangible. Um, <clears throat> we are all memory. Memory is the past. The past is to me is what a foundation that we can build tomorrows upon. Our memory is our past is the roadmap for the next generation to come so they know how far of our journey ahead. 
been travel on the roads of a uh, road of life or a life journey and it's uh to me it is everything it is is what without those two elements you know it's almost like nothing that we can work upon to me i i i that's the core of my work, you know, have to be along those two lines, you know, as everything is based on what happened, the memory and how it's provoked my presence and also the futures. Thank you. Thanks, Tavi. Thanks, uh, Brian and then Kalia. Uh, I had a specific question for Kalia, uh, which was, how are the experiences of refugee Hmong women different from that of men? And do you think about this question when you write? I love that question. And I love it in light of the book that I've just submitted to my editor, um, which is my mother's memoir, Return of the Refugee. The reality is that when we talk about wars, when we talk about refugees, it's often through the perspectives and the and the anecdotes, the realities of men <clears throat> across the board. We know this to be true. Um, as a Hmong woman, when I began writing, I think it was very clear I sought out to write my grandmother's story. And then I went to my father's and then I went to a lot of people's stories. And then I'm coming back finally to my mother's in my 41st year of life after I've become a mother myself. Um, I didn't feel ready up to now. And I think that's because there's a lot of, there's a great deal of unspoken pain. Um, without avenues of engaging and expressing true of women from around the world, particularly true in the, in the refugee context. I think our, our views have really, uh, have not been validated or recognized or even seen or heard. And so I think there are definite differences. You know, I think all the time about how my mother was just 16 when she left her mother to be with my father. And how even now, after all of these years, she wakes up from dreams shaking dreams of parting with her mother in the jungle, dreams of not running to hold her mother close, dreams of never having had the opportunity to say goodbye. Growing up, my mother always said to me, may I one day when I go and I see my mother again, that day didn't happen, not in this world that we belong to, not in accordance with the hopes of my own mother. My grandmother died. My mother, by the time she was able to go back to Laos, saw a gravestone a gravestone with a tiny little door, a spiritual door. You know, and growing up, my mother always said, when I meet my mother again, I'm gonna tell her everything that's happened since we parted. I'm gonna tell her that the love that she gave me in those first 16 years of life, that they were enough to carry me through. But Ryan, the moment my mother came upon my grandmother's headstone, what I, the gravestone, what I saw happen was the unraveling of the women I knew as mine. She became somebody else's little girl, somebody else's daughter. The thing that came out were the cries of a child for a mother. This is a reality that not a lot of men will talk about. This is a reality that not a lot of people, I think, think they need to hear or to see or to witness or to understand. You know, I, by this point, you know, I mean, I'm, on, this is, I'm on my ninth book, this will be my 10th. And I have a fairly strong sales record. Um, but but even then, some of the editors were like, why do we need the story from this perspective? The question was, what does a refugee woman have to offer a history that we have already so thoroughly explored in the white in the white lens and then and then via these other works that you've done? The question is always, do we have anything important enough to say? And I'm always having to say, we're here too. And in fact, many of my generation are here not because of the men in their lives, they're here because of the incredible women. You know, Ryan, my grandmother raised nine children after my grandfather died. She kept them alive. She brought them. She led them through to the refugee camps of Thailand. And she helped raise all of us in America. So many of the people of my generation belong to incredible matriarchs. And then there are this, this other wave of women, women in my mother's generation. And so there's so much unknown, so much to explore. And I've always thought about this. It's shaped everything I, I do. 
because always when people see me in the world, they don't see me first necessarily as a writer, a Hmong or an American. They see me first as a short, tiny woman. Like, what do you have to say that we haven't yet heard? What do you have to offer this, this perspective on war, politics of being? And so totally, I've thought about this from my very first emergence as a writer. I think about it every time I enter the college environment, the university environment to teach, to read, to write, to speak. I think about it in this virtual sphere where our voices or images are meeting. Um, so yeah, totally. Thank you, Kalia. Yeah. Uh, I had a question for Brian. Uh, in what mm -hmm. ways do you think poetry and literature captures allow experience that works of history, sociology? I think I covered that with you know, my previous answer here. So I'll, I will just simply you know, do a quick recap there. Is that um, the, po the poet poetry and literature you know, then provide us alternate ways of looking experiences as well that is beyond going just beyond you know what are the often convenient facts that serve you know particular interests then and you know, we can start telling things from my own perspective or at least i remember you know in the early years when you know there were allegations of uh, pogroms being conducted against the Hmong in the early years after the end of a conflict you know for example you know but you know you know that the Hmong would come up to uh, USAID workers or to you know, people who are working in refugee resettlement and say, hey, this is happening. It's like, oh, well, do you have proof? But well, what do you mean proof? What constitutes proof? Do you need you know, what it's like, you know, photographs? Do you need a signed you know, deposition? You know, all these different questions. And like, we're just running for our lives. And all these questions out there. And I think the uh, problem is, is that I find myself just saying that you know, more and more I want us to make sure that we have a literature that's also available to allow ourselves to ask questions and to also ask a, a what if even that you know as we look back on our specific history for example it's very hard you know for many of our elders you know to say oh in 1954 the Vietnamese defeated you know the French at Dien Bien Phu and that's just how it was always going to go that we don't get to ask that question, oh, well, what if they had? What would you have done if there had been a you know, French victory? What would have happened, for example, if, if you know, where, where do you think we made our biggest mistake? That without poetry, without literature, give, given ourselves the freedom to explore the alternatives of what could have happened, you know, then our conversations become much more difficult than that we it's probably impolitic to say, but yeah, I just believe that refugees need to go beyond just taking it, just taking this history that's imposed by others, you know, and, and to you know, do a thorough interrogation. What's that old Wango Boingo song from the 1980s? You don't ask too many questions when you're on the winning side, and yet you should, even in what you think is victory, even perhaps in what we think is defeat. We need to continue to ask our questions. Then what were we fighting for? What were we reaching for? And maybe you know, what else could we reach for instead if something didn't work? Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, there was a question for Tavi. Uh, after your first book and film, are you working on another book and film? Uh, and if so, can you share a bit about what you are working on? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I, in between uh, different film projects, I've been writing uh, books. And I have the, my upcoming book called uh, Brace, uh, uh, Grace Embracer. <laughs> and uh, it's the book's about uh, three mother, mother earth, mother natures, and mother who share her womb. Uh, for the birds of humanities and, and life and is about based on my mother um, um, and her struggle and how uh, Buddhism had so much influence in in a lot of cultures in the society 
and how she able to, uh, because her upbringing was so rooted within uh, Theravada Buddhism. So through her Buddhist and the philosophy of Buddhism, it helped her to able to overcome her struggle. And me as her first son, who uh, witnessed witness, uh, all of her struggle and, and, um, and what she had to go through in life. And it made me to become a man who has seen the world through the eyes of a woman. So I, I write this book just to honor my mother and all the mother in the world, including Mother Earth and Mother Nature. And as a man, I think is my honor to share with the rest of the world or all the rest of the men out there in the world, how much women have to give and have to sacrifice just for the existence of the humanity in general. And if you don't mind, I'd love to read a small little section of how I start the book. Is it okay? Please do. I am truly my mother's great embracer. I am my mother's son. My mother is a woman who had a gut full of wisdom, a heart of a tiger, the soul of a Buddha, the spirit of a thousand warrior, a sense of a falcon, a mouse of samurai sword's blade, a hands of Renaissance man, a survival skill of an ant, and a medical and mathematical skill of a calculator. My mother was illiterate, but one of the widest women that I ever knew. My mother is a woman who had been to hells and backs at least 999 times in her life just to make the wrong thing right. My mother, my hero, the woman who I have utmost admirations and the one who I always embrace and idolize, my mother. That's the books. And uh, I also, when I was here, I moved from New York City to North Carolina. And when I first came here, we met the, um, the first African-American uh, drag race champion. So we end up corroborating to make a documentary film about his life, about his contribution. He's the man who uh, had to uh, establish uh, NASCAR. But unfortunately, um, he passed away in the process of making film uh, like three weeks ago. Uh, I'm still very choked up with that. And, and he's like a brother to me. And um, we have so much in common. And unfortunately, you know, the project had to be <laughs> dismissed. But also in the editing of the film uh, project right now is about the, uh, the Buddhism in Laos. And hopefully it should be out on Netflix sometime by maybe early next year. And uh, right now we have a working title called Saffron's Master. And it's about uh, the Buddhist monk in, um, in Wat Pa Pao in Long Prabang. It's about him uh, uh, bringing all of the kids from ethnic minority from the rural area who didn't have an access to education or have no parent. A lot of those kids were often. And people who uh, have absolutely no opportunity uh, to have education. So what he does, he uh, built the school in his own temple and raised them and treat them like his own children and, um, and, uh, and, and the film is about how, in, how inspirational this man, what he had done with absolutely nothing and able to give so much to the world and to the life and to the need of the society and the community that at most needed. And it's very inspirational uh, uh, film project. And we are in the final edit process right now. And same as my books, my second book is also in the final edit process right now. Hopefully be able to get to see uh, those works sometime soon.
Thank you. Thank you, Tavi. Uh, there were two related questions about writing in one's own language, one's mother tongue, rather. Uh, one question was, do you aspire to write in your own mother tongue as well? And do you struggle with the fact that you're writing in a foreign language that will never be accessible to many of your own people? And uh, there was a related question about um, what do you think uh, about the role of Lao and Hmong language text in the diaspora for the next 50 years? What kind of language programs, translation projects, and publications should we advocate for now until 2073? Uh, Kalia, would you like to answer and maybe Brian can speak and then Tavi could speak? Yes. Lovely. You know, the question of language is very interesting. When people meet me, they assume that I'm writing in a, in a different language. But the reality is that my, while well, I learned how to speak Hmong first, and I'm, I think, very fluent in Hmong. Um, I learned how to write first in English. So in many ways, when I'm writing in English, I have the key. I'm not knocking on somebody's door or ringing a doorbell. I can unlock that door and I can slam it too, right? The house that I built in English is mine. And I understand the dangers of that colonial tongue. I understand the work, in many ways, the violations uh, that it's caused my people and so many other people around the world, which is why I think I feel a tremendous amount of responsibility to use that language respectfully. As a writer, I know that I live and die by the word. It is my currency into the world. It is the current in which I must learn how to swim if I am to survive in this field. But it is a fraught, you know, um, linguistic tradition that I that I am entering into, and yet, you know, I saw in the questions there was, there was a quick question about whether our work is in conversation. Totally, our work is in conversation. When the National Endowment for the Arts selected the late homecomer as a big V title, it replaced the poetry of Emily Dickinson and Huck Finn, Mark Twain's Huck Finn, and in many ways, those those books were seminal to my training in the English language. And yet I always have to be honest too. When the question is asked, who are your biggest literary influences? When I was a much younger writer, I used to talk about Louise Erdrich, who I, who I love, like one of the great writers working in America at the moment. I talk about Robert Frost, because every kid in St. Paul Public Schools, you know, encountered the poem, two roads diverge in a yellow wood. I took the one less traveled and that has made all the difference. But the reality is that long before I met those writers, I was trained in storytelling at the feet of my elders. I remember my, my uncle Ju, Kuduhachu, he used to spread out his arm because we didn't have books in the refugee camp. And he said, every piece of hair on my arm, this is a tree. He'd hold up his fist and he said, and these are the mountains, may I? My veins, these are the rivers. The whole of his world would emerge on the stretch of his arm. Every time I go to the page, I see that arm, that flesh before me, no longer firm as it had been. Now when I press on my uncle's arm and I make indentations, the skin doesn't push right back up. His skin, in fact, falls away from the bone. It's marked by gravity and so many other pressures, pressures of being here in America, of being illiterate in a, in a culture, learning how to survive regardless. And, and so I, it is the living flesh, the people that I come from, that I see when I go to the page. And that is the work that I use the English language to do. I didn't learn how to write in Hmong until I went to college. I went to Carleton College for the very first time. And that's when I learned how to miss Hmong people. Because I've grown up on the east side of St. Paul. I went to a high school where 51% of the student body were Hmong like me. Except, of course, for the IB curriculum where I was in when I became one of very few at Carleton and then later at Columbia University, I became very lonely. And that is really where I finessed Hmong. The Hmong that I learned, I use uh, for the people I love. So when I'm writing my mom and my dad, I will revert automatically to Hmong. I don't say, you know, I don't say, I love you. I say, I don't say, <clears throat> do you miss me? I say, it is a very intimate language that I hold quite sacred. Like written Hmong is very sacred for me. And it is the space in which it's a playground in which I can play. My father likes to say to me that I was born in an ocean of love so big that my hands have never touched the sides. My feet has never touched the bottom. 
that is the ocean that I find myself swimming in when I enter into Hmong on the page, which means it's a very soft language, which means that it doesn't allow me to pull the punches and the kicks that I sometimes can do in English when I feel called to, when, when the moment I'm in demands that I take on that kind of force, that kind of power. And so I recognize that English allows me different tools to do the work that I do. But that's the beauty of being bilingual. It's the beauty of being bicultural. You know, I know that in the Hmong tradition, when we really love somebody, we sniff them. You sniff in a baby, you sniff in the scent of someone you love. In America, it's like a rubbing of surfaces, right? Options. That is what a writer needs on the page. When I can stop halfway and say, I can end this sentence this way or that way. Options. And that's what the languages give me. I'm a much more powerful writer because I can situate myself in both languages comfortably and let them do the work of my heart. Wow. Uh, I mean, obviously that's you know, a lot for us all to process here. So let's take a quick second on that. Why, as even I think about it myself, the, uh, the, I come at it from a space as a writer working with a human disability as well then that, um, and sometimes I've often wondered about that. Like, how would my journey be different if um, I had grown up fully immersed in the Lao language, in the other languages of our people in our communities? After all, Laos has over 160 ethnicities um, within um, our you know, traditional homeland borders. Then. And so, you know, you know, you know, who has all the language? which might well be the question. And I think that was something that I was honored and privileged to talk with some of our youth and our elders about as well, because oftentimes I think the younger you know, generation often feels uncomfortable you know, trying to even begin to tell our community stories then because they say, well, I don't speak Lao that well. I don't speak Hmong that well. I don't speak you know, whichever language they feel that they should be most you know, tied to. And I've tried to point out this is, in effect, you know, a very real effect of the colonialism, of the imperialism of you know, previous you know, de uh, decades, if not centuries, even going all the way back. You know, and and you know, we have to recognize that, that it doesn't have to be an impediment. It doesn't have to be a handicap, as it were. But I think about the experience of the Nigerian filmmakers you know, then who were you know, thrown out of the foreign film category then because the Oscars say that it has to be in your language and the Nigerians were saying, you know, British colonization is so you know, thorough here that the common language is English right now. Yeah, they'd love to have been able to have you know, done you know, a film completely in you know, one of the Nigerian you know, traditional languages there, but that wasn't available to them. It's, what they, that it's who they are today. And so I ask myself about that, about what does that mean for us? It's not to say that we you know, shy away or that, you know, all English all the time, but that you see it as an opening and as if it's gateway instead. And I think more importantly, I was always fortunate that in California during my time out in you know, Pasadena, I managed to see an exhibition on um, a poet, John Milton, who had come out of the, um, Civil wars in England then you know, survived and traumatized then. And as he starts putting together one of his poetry masterpieces, Paradise Lost, he suddenly realized that the English language that he had access to him in England, literal England, did not have the words he needed to capture you know, that experience. And so he had to start just making up words, having to um, use words that we use um, to this day words like phantasmagoria, for example, pandemonium, all these um, classic terms. And so I just find myself saying, you know, how do you see that as a beginning? You know, how do we see that as a point of curiosity? And it's like, you know, you know today it's like, you know, I can't guarantee you that we'll ever use the word sub ID the way that Americans use the word aloha or hasta la vista baby or nachos. I do believe that you know, as all of our writers in our community take a word, take a two, word or two and um, give it a try. Maybe you know, bring us back to the traditional meaning, maybe help that meaning expand and blossom into something more. But what do you think, Tommy? Uh, <laughs> I, I just 
can only talk from my personal point of view and how I utilize the language in terms of writing. Uh, because I, I, you know, when, when I visualize and hear the word before I written down into the paper, I, I visualize and hear it in my own mother tongue in Laos. <clears throat> because simply because all of those words are my memory and the true essence of my existence of who I am, what I am, and what I've been experiencing in life is restored in my memory. Sometime in words, sometime in feeling, uh, sometime in visual memory. And I'm very comfortable when I write, writing in English. But through the thought process before I wrote, written those words, as always, uncomfortable and, and usually visualizing and seeing and hearing and feeling in, in, in Laos, in the mother tongues. But another problem that I have as a, as a writer, you know, and even though I'm very comfortable writing, uh, writing in, in English, but when I read it back to, uh, uh, but I have a difficult time to read um, what I write in English, in English. <laughs> As you can see, my struggle uh, when I try to read my little thing, you know, is because of my conscience of my pronunciation, you know, because I came to this uh, country when I'm already uh, 18 years old. And, you know, I surpassed the time of I can be, you know, speak English in in the, in, in, the, in the perfect tone, you know, that's, that's impossible in my lifetime. So but again you know as for me from my personal point of view uh foreseeing the future of the lao language in america i am I'm, I'm very skeptical because uh, i think the uh educational system in america you know we are not very wide open enough to have the southeast asian language as part of the study not even in the university you know and especially, you know, I, I can speak up from uh, my experience through my uh, daughter, you know, when she was born, um, when, before she go to school, she speak Lao perfectly and understand Lao perfectly. And she still un understand Lao perfectly. Uh, in fact, I on, also start teaching her how to read and write Lao. But as soon as she go into school, that was it. That was the end of her loudness, whatever the end. <laughs> and, and, and part of her being assimilated to this so-called American melting pot, you know, from her little uh, point of view, I believe that she had to completely sacrifice what's back at home, you know, to be part of those pie, you have to be what is out there. She stopped eating vegetable, no longer speak the language. <laughs> and, but she understand perfectly everything we spoke to her, but it's just, just the communication, um, which I can, uh, which I can see, you know, throughout uh, uh, our community, Southeast Asian communities, just including, you know, Laotian of all ethnic cities, and I can see that, you know, like many time, uh, most of the parents are working all the time. They hardly home, uh, spend time with the kid, you know. So when they're growing up, the kid don't really uh, learn how to speak Laos or the the mother tongue. You know, the, the teachers is the TV. So when they grow older, it's, it's become uh, beside the generation gap in terms of cultural differences, but also the language, you know, it's become so harsh for communication between parents and children because during the time when the kid growing up and the parent never home and the kid never get a chance to have able to learn to speak the language. So when they get older, it's very hard for parents to speak something very deeply and to able to express themselves to their children, you know, like something culturally and something historical, whatever they want to relate down to, passing on to them, they, they couldn't receive it. it it's, it's a great loss in our communities. And, and I don't know um, in the future, that's why, you know, as, as being a writer, we, we try, I think every one of us try our best, you know, to implement the mother tongues included into our, our, our writing, you know, 
as as far as uh, I uh, haven't shared with you, I also wrote a number of uh, children's book, but it's haven't published uh, pub, uh, publishing one yet. But I've been written number of books, so I think eleven of them so far. And that's you know I, I want to explore uh, the children's book children's book that that uh, <clears throat> that have the um, have to deal with like the uh, the issue of displacement, you know, like a refugee sort of experience, like the interracial marriage children, you know, and um, <clears throat> and those kind of of you know along the uh, the lines that is not very uh, much out there in in a, in in the, in in the children's book world, you know, from raising my daughter, you know, I pretty much find as many books as I can to read to her, but never touch upon the kid about refugee or displacements, you know, the people who are landless, wireless, and 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 countryless like we are today, you know, those, but how can those kids be proud of their identity? You know, every time you want to tell them, you know, they are important, it's very important to recognize yourself as being Lao, but when they have no other you know, as an, uh, uh, any material out there to teach them or for them that they can lean upon or, or use it as something that they can, is, is tangible for them. You know, that's why I think is is a great responsibility for us, you know, as a writer that we need to, uh, part of preserving the history, you know, the language, the cultures, the history, whatever out there is very much depending on writing because you know, this is going to be the only medium that's going to exist, you know, after we long pass. So that's why, to me, uh, to see what the uh, Library of Congress have done is a tremendous, is a greatest gift for our community. And also the great, greatest gift of all is to be able to have a writer, you know, and, and it's my great honor to be able to share this moment with two of you, and, and I'm so choking hearing your, your story, both of your story. That's why when my turn to speak, I was choking up. I don't know what to say. <laughs> and, and it's so beautiful. I got to read one of your book. And thank you for sharing with us. And, and really, it's such an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we are, we have time for maybe one last question. I know we can't uh, answer all of the questions, uh, but there was one question, uh, which was, what most do you want people to take away from your work and how should people be changed or think differently? And maybe we can uh, ask uh, Kalia and then Brian and then uh, Tavi, and uh, we'll conclude after that. Thank you. So in my children's books, I think often about the magic of my childhood. We have conceptions about how children grow up in refugee camps. Some of those are true, others are not. Um, you know, but the magic of my childhood, the beauty of it, every time I pointed to the moon, the moon came and sliced my ear. You know, I had to lick my hands and wipe my ears with pig poop and chicken poop so that the moon wouldn't come. Um, there are dragons everywhere in the world that I belong to. You know, they come out to drink every time you see a rainbow arch its back across the, the sky. This is the kind of beauty of my world that I'm hoping to impart on my young readers. I understand that I have a responsibility to fan, to fan the flames of literacy. And, and of course, to invite others into the incredible, I think, opportunities that have been given to me because of where I'm positioned. Um, in my adult works, it's a very different world. I am looking to inspire you to understand not only my story, but your own better. Now, my first book is called The Late Homecomer. The late homecomer because I understood as even as I was writing it that it would be one of the first and that it had been long overdue that book on the bookshelves of a bigger world. The late homecomer also because I, under, I understand that we as a nation are still coming home to each other. All we need to do is look at the news. America doesn't quite belong yet because we don't belong to all of us. And that is I think one of the responsibilities that I take on as a writer quite seriously. We don't need a law to, to, to be able to offer belonging to each other. That is a gift that we can give. And so in many ways, my work is about empowering the individual. I believe that we never just pass each other by. Like today, all of us are on this panel together. Today, we are characters in each other's books. What kind of character does Ngokalia Ya want to be? 
what kind of character is Brian today? And how does this character inform the life story that is my own? And that of my, not only my ancestors, the thousands who died so I could be here, but my descendants, the ones whose foundations I'm building every single day with the work that I do. In the Hmong culture, we have this practice. My family, um, we have a traditional practice where we make a, a feast and we call all of the ancestors to the table. When I was a kid, I didn't know any of the names that my dad was calling. And now it's peopled by my aunts and my uncles, people who loved me and people who I love. And now I understand that one day, the time will come for me to take my place at the ancestral table. And I think about that, my role, my role as an ancestor. And so that is something that I offer in my work. When, regardless of age, regardless of genre, that is something that I'm offering, a sensibility of the world, a gift and a welcome that all of life is a blessing, that we have enough time to make each other's lives better. Brian? Well, and again, I think I'll close it out here, addressing this by just showing an example of my own is that I believe that it is so important for us to reach for the fullest of the human experiences that we can now. So I often try to make sure that people can see that you know, we love, we fear. You know, sometimes we, we disappoint ourselves, sometimes we disappoint others, and yet we still come back to that table. You know, that, that is part of the great American journey, the great our journey, the great long journey. So many of you know, cultures and communities around the globe you know, they need to you know, understand, again, the full meaning of what it means to pick yourself back up and to sometimes laugh and to remember and to still keep dreaming. So, again, maybe these two poems, uh, it's like you might wonder what it's all about. Some of you might get it. And, you know, some of you might just say, I can write a better poem than that. And I hope you will. So, this came out of so many of our um, community members who are trying to tell their stories, particularly you know, when they run into the um, complications that come with you know, the American media system and how we teach our stories to one another. The poem is called Pitching. Pitching. To be frank, big trouble in middle Champasak probably isn't going to bring in the matinee crowds we need. It might not make it to you know, sci-fi, let alone lifetime. Your pitch for Dr. Sun May Strikes Again wasn't quite the response to battle him of a tiger mother we were looking for. Zombies stretch her budget a bit too far. Her betrayal may have gotten an Oscar nomination, but that won't buy you lunch off this side of town. Not even used hubcaps for a junky grand to read. <laughs> You laugh too much at your origin story. If you survive CIA black ops and make it to America, you need tears galore, but no one takes you seriously. An enduring smile and a sub ID for being alive in the diaspora is unbelievable. No one's fed up breakable. No one. Nobody knows what's so funny about an American werewolf in Ron Krabat. They definitely won't buy the story of Dracula, immune to garlic and lemongrass, but dreading punchy steaks of bamboo. Sleepless in Savannah Kid will not be the feel-good breakout rom-com of the year for obvious reasons, even with Angelina. Neither will how Supami got her groove back. Let's try with fresh off the starships, but that's a hard pass. We had in mind more of a Miss Saigon with Pad Pai meets the Joy Luck Slumdog namesake in translation for your undiscovered country. It's premature to be discussing the shared universe between Elephant Stomp, Princess of Laos, and Lao Warrior. We won't lay the groundwork for Laos exploitation cinema with your avenging Morlock Godfather. Little Laos on the Prairie of a movie has a shot, but we can't see a love interest for Matt Damon. We're frustrated. But remember, you don't exist in America without a movie about yourselves, please. What are you going to do? Write a poem? Yeah, good luck with a better Mulani. A more of a point. Narrative of the Nox Ears. The Nox is the uh, Lao equivalent of the Monja. 
uh, and you know, this one goes, never read my life as the diary of some sad refugee. My account is not intended as routine narrative of adversity overcome, mere survival once again, transcending a descent to white hot hell converted to a placid limbo of frogs. No, I miss a familiar strange here in a way you cannot fathom. Our hard ghosts remain vigilant, thin as an ink scratch on an old palm leaf, haunting with a tongue claimed incomprehensible. The old signposts have been lost, but in strangeness, possibility, I hope, moving, a shadow in uncertain passages, making melodies for newsless souls. In daring this, might I shape some limitless star? We, scrambling to replace what we barely knew, barely recognized our tangled metamorphosis, our hymns of recovery, organs of uncertain purpose in the body cosmos, mistaken easily for endings, not new beginnings. And I don't want to thank you very much for all of your you know, time on this. Thing. Thank you all. And I'll turn it over to you, Tommy, to close this out. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> <clears throat> As for me, um, my hope for the work that I have done, uh, it doesn't matter if film or screenplay, children's books, memoirs. All I hope is that whoever ever come across my works, <clears throat> I hope it can inspire them so they can become their own writer, become their own narrator of their own story. And I remember when I was in my ESL program back in the eighties, and one day my ESL uh, uh, teachers asked me, says, son, what do you want to be when you, when, when you go to college? I said, I want to be a writer. And he's looked at me and he said, son, Thing again, maybe you should do something else because I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's good for you because um, I can't even read a word in your essay <laughs> and you want to become a writer. And I said, yeah, I will be a writer one day. And so I became a writer. To me, <clears throat> It doesn't matter uh, the language. It doesn't matter you know or you don't in terms of grammatic. But if you write a word that's written in your heart, as embedded in, in your memory, and you can feel in your heart, it doesn't matter what language you write. The word will find its way to the heart of other people somehow. I think I'm living proof of that. You know, my English wasn't that great. I'm still learning every day. Uh, English is not my strongest language uh, of all the languages that I know. But everything I do, I, I, I do from my heart. As we all know, the Laotians are the people that are made up from the heart. As we, can, as we all can see, that's embedded in all the most uh, um, powerful, powerful words in, in, in Laos. Let's say Khop Jai, circumference of your heart. Phum Jai, fully heart. <laughs> Di Jai, good heart. So everything that from the Laos is from the heart. So I hope that whatever the word that from our heart tonight, that able to inspire the younger generation, that they can learn how to utilize what our inheritance had given to us. We don't have much, but we have our heart. We have the memory. We have their love and, and their hope. So that we as a writers can build up our future upon these concrete foundations and the gift, the best gift that we ever have from our ancestor. 
it's the language, the memory, the experience. So even though as very young age as we are, we live at least nine or 10 lives already. And, and let's record it and let's put it out there because this is our history. If you don't write it down, this history will be lost. So we're not just a writer, in my personal opinion, but we are a living historian. So we have to share our history by writing it, by showing it, by living it and being it and keep giving and sharing as long as we live. And thank you so much for sharing your heart. I try my best to do for my heart. And I hope people can understand me. I um, apologize for my not well-spoken English. <laughs> I do my best. Thank you. Thank you, Tavi and Kalia and Brian. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, I, you know, I really appreciate everyone coming out tonight for this event. It was uh, really extremely wonderful um, and a unique moment uh, that we could all enjoy together talking about uh, these three wonderful authors and their works. Uh, so that will conclude it for us tonight. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can uh, follow uh, the three authors here and uh, hear more of their works and, and uh, follow them in other venues and other forums. So uh, thanks everyone. Okay. Okay.